imagine. You're sitting in the middle of the rainforest. What do you see? Trees, beautiful flowers, vines, the smells are rich and textured. The air hydrates your skin. I have no doubt you're hoping to see some of the unique wildlife we associate with these biodiverse areas. Waiting for a toucan, perhaps, with their brilliant colors to land nearby. Animals are interesting, captivating, but what about the plants you overlooked? Are they not interesting as well? Why do we take plants for granted? Our education teaches us the importance of plants our entire lives. They feed us, provide us with shelter and technology. They exist within our medicines. What they don't teach us is that plants are just as interesting as animals. No, they are not cute and fuzzy. They do not necessarily move in interesting ways. Many are immobile. Because plants are not as interesting, they are, in many ways, taken for granted. We perceive plants as ever-available necessities. They exist as a backdrop for the organisms they support and interact with. This is the basis for plant blindness, and I am here today to bring your attention to this issue. We have cast aside some of the most interesting and important organisms because we have no major interest in them. Plants perform impressive biological activities that surpass the sophistication of many animals. Their immobility forces them to adapt to new ways of overcoming this limitation and are complex and fascinating. How do they obtain nutrients when they cannot move? How do they defend themselves against predators? How do they interact with the organisms surrounding them? We depreciate these tasks with simple answers. Their roots take up nutrients, they develop thorns to deter herbivores, and they only provide other organisms with food and shelter. These are the answers we learn at a young age, and although they are correct, they are underwhelming compared to what actually occurs. No wonder we belittle their importance. Too much detail exists within these processes for me to cover in this talk alone. I will, therefore, focus on an attribute of plants we don't consider directly important to us, plant defense. Plants' defenses are not just physical, as the thorns on your rose bush. Many of their defenses are unseen to the naked eye. Let me explain what I mean. Plant defense involves direct and indirect defenses. These categories contain subcategories. Already, plants are becoming more complicated than our surface level understanding. The defense is energetically expensive, and unless they are carnivorous, plants make their own food. Plants have limited energy, so they must limit the amount they spend on processes that aren't as critical for their survival. Plants have two lines of defense to limit their expenses. They have consistently present defenses and triggered defenses. Defenses either directly affect the herbivore or indirectly affect them. An indirect defense involves signaling to the herbivore's predator that their prey is eating the plant's tissues. Direct and indirect defenses are triggered or remain in place. Furthermore, defense either acts locally where the herbivore is attacking them or throughout the plant. Unfortunately, herbivores will sometimes build a tolerance to the plant's defenses. Because of this, the plants must adapt to their predators. This means they produce many different compounds for different predators and purposes. As such, thousands of different compounds exist. These compounds are what we use in our medicines. They can be incredibly toxic towards the targeted herbivore, either directly or upon digesting the plant's tissues. I will be talking about one family of compounds in particular today called alkaloids. Researchers have identified over 3,000 types of alkaloids in over 4,000 plant species. Alkaloids affect us by inhibiting or activating enzymes in our cells and tissues. Enzymes catalyze all kinds of reactions in our bodies. Without an enzyme, the reaction does not occur as quickly or efficiently. A reaction without an enzyme is like boiling water over medium heat. With an enzyme is like boiling water over high heat. Enzymes exist for nearly every reaction that occurs in our bodies, in nearly every cell type. Different metabolic pathways produce alkaloids and many involve enzymes. Alkaloids also affect genetic processes by inhibiting protein synthesis in our bodies. Alkaloids make up many well-known drugs. Some familiar alkaloid-based drugs include nicotine, morphine, and codeine from opium poppies, caffeine, and cocaine. Alkaloid production occurs within certain plant families, including the poppy family, buttercups, nightshades, and amaryllis. 
This family of compounds affects different areas of the herbivore's body in different ways. To a caterpillar, nicotine would be fatal to ingest. This is what the plant produces nicotine for, self-defense. In humans, it acts as a sedative and a stimulant, releasing a rush of dopamine and adrenaline into our bodies, leading to increased heart rate and blood pressure and feelings of pleasure. This is what leads to the feeling of a head rush. Though it does not poison us as it does a caterpillar, large enough doses have lethal effects. Alkaloids can also have hallucinogenic properties, like in psilocybin and mescaline. This is a large field of research. Historically, we've always used plants in medicine. We know that they are effective, but we don't always know why. Modern science allows us to understand the effects of these compounds. Once studied and understood, we can target alkaloid effects for specific purposes. Large amounts of research have determined what impacts the productions of these alkaloids. Natural products are less likely to have adverse effects when they're used for treatments. Researchers, therefore, want to discover as many plant compounds as possible to use in medicine and understand how they work. We need to understand how these compounds work and what contributes to their production. A study conducted by N. Sachan and colleagues demonstrates that by understanding what affects alkaloid production, we might be able to increase its production more easily, and not with chemicals. Before cells develop into a specific cell type where they perform a specific job, they are called undifferentiated cells. These cells multiply quickly as tissues are developing, which contribute to the organism's growth. This is beneficial within a laboratory setting as this feature allows cells to be more easily mass produced. Mass production allows us to get more of these alkaloids faster. The problem with undifferentiated cells is that they can lose their ability to produce metabolites like alkaloids. Making specific compounds is usually up to differentiated cells, whose job it is to make those compounds. De-differentiated cells lose their specific purpose and are also more likely to stop producing these compounds. Different environmental conditions can reduce compound production for undifferentiated or de-differentiated cells. N. Sachan's research determined how to minimize the loss of alkaloid production in these plant cells by changing their environmental conditions. Their work focused primarily on the alkaloid nicotine. Their main point of focus rested on an important enzyme within plant cells involved in making nicotine called PMT. They wanted to know if the plant hormone auxin and light impacted the nicotine production pathway in undifferentiated and tobacco tissues by reducing the activity of PMT. They hypothesized that the absence of light and auxin would increase nicotine production in undifferentiated cells. They also hypothesized that reactive oxygen species, a byproduct of photosynthesis, decrease the activity of PMT and lead to decreased nicotine production in plants exposed to light. ROS scavengers called DMTU and catalase would prevent some ROS activity and increase PMT activity in nicotine production. Their hypotheses were confirmed. PMT activity is lowered when auxin and light are in highest concentration with the most activity in dark without auxin. Light has more of a dramatic effect on PMT activity which led them to believe that the reactive oxygen species that are a byproduct of photosynthesis are indeed what represses PMT. Oxen production increases with increased light, which would also contribute to increased PMT repression. Reactive oxygen species scavengers are responsible for diminishing the effects of the reactive oxygen species. When applied to tissue exposed to light, the reactive oxygen species scavenger, DMTU, overcame the PMT repression that would normally come with light and auxin. Catalase also overcomes PMT repression, but only slightly less than DMTU. In an interesting turn of events, they discovered that catalase increases alkaloid production more than DMTU. They believe this is because DMTU affects another part of the alkaloid production pathway. This is all incredibly specific, and no doubt you're wondering why I spit this seemingly unimportant jargon at you. These results show that certain conditions, like increased light or hormone presence, make undifferentiated cells' success at producing important compounds diminish. These conditions impact the enzymes that cells use to make these compounds. 
In this case, light and auxin affected PMT, a necessary enzyme in nicotine production. Based on this research, researchers can take advantage of these findings to increase alkaloid production in undifferentiated plant tissues and have an easier time mass producing them. Undifferentiated tissues are easier and faster to cultivate, which makes mass producing them easier than differentiated tissues. If researchers can determine which conditions prevent the production of other metabolites from other plants, they could increase the compound production within their undifferentiated tissues and make them on a larger scale. This will make more alkaloid-based medications available to us in larger quantities and faster in the future. That's what's important. Although nicotine is not a substance we might consider we should research because of the problems associated with its consumption, it is an important stepping stone. Knowing more about nicotine might help us learn more about other alkaloid producing plants that we do consider important. Acquiring groundwork knowledge like that found by N. Sachan and colleagues allows us to apply the same concepts to other plants and the alkaloids they produce. Many lesser known alkaloids have important purposes in medicine. Quinidine comes from Cinicolina plants and treats arrhythmias. Less familiar alkaloid compounds include anti-cancer drugs like vinca alkaloids, taxanes, and others. Vinca alkaloids used as anti-cancer therapies include vinblastine, vintifolide, vincristine, and vinerelbine. These mostly come from the periwinkle family, with the strongest anti-cancer drugs coming from the Madagascar periwinkle. Imagine applying the principle discovered by N. Sachan and colleagues to a plant like the Madagascar periwinkle. If researchers can determine what the best conditions for vinca alkaloid synthesis are, they could potentially mass produce these compounds at more efficient rates for anti-cancer therapies. These could potentially be less toxic and hard on the body compared to synthetic anti-cancer drugs. We haven't focused on plants' potential, so it's hard to say. Much more research is in progress and needs to begin to determine how these plant compounds affect us. This is why it is so important to fight plant blindness these organisms are highly complex and specific, with so much potential application. They are intricate and take dedicated and diligent work to understand. Much more research still needs to begin to understand everything there is to know about them. Plants are interesting. They are just as, if not more complex than some animals, and more so than most of the bacteria we have come to know so much about. So the next time you look at a plant, don't let these amazing organisms fall into the background. Let's defeat plant blindness together.